times. Now please welcome Daniel Schultz. I, uh, I don't in any way um, want to seem ungrateful uh, to Nick, um, but uh, a few years ago I was at the Hungry Mind Bookstore uh, in uh, St. Paul, another legendary bookstore that's sadly gone out of business. And uh, as I was coming out of the store, um, I ran into the author um, Andrew Vash, who, who writes uh, mystery novels. And he's this real thin guy with a hot face, and he's got an eye patch. And he was standing out there on the, the sidewalk, smoking a cigarette before he came in to read the novel. Now that is an introduction to an author that you will not forget. <laughs> well, we seem to be uh, profoundly stuck in our national politics. As the lawyer Jay Ackroyd puts it, uh, effective and popular policy seems incredibly uh, uh, difficult to implement, while policies that benefit only a few pass through the system because of political circumstance and institutional bias. So the big question of the day uh, for the progressive movement is, how do we get unstuck? Uh, we can't begin to undo the damage done by the last administration, let alone move things in a more constructive direction until we get this whale off. Now, on the tactical level, there are a few clear answers to uh, this question of our collective stuckness. We need a uh, Senate reform to lessen the minority's power to obstruct uh, popular legislation. We need to stop the money train to uh, government. And we need to fire the blue dogs uh, who have been conspiring uh, with uh, Republicans to hold up popular progressive legisl legislation. But on a strategic, well, on a philosophical level, um, this turns out to be a very difficult question. Anybody who studied American politics for more than about five minutes knows that it is perverse to the point of insanity. And the uh, requirement for justice seldom enters into its equations. So the question progressives are really faced with these days is how to create and sustain a truly transformative politics. One that ensures that the deal that we get 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road is better than the deal that we get today. And unless I have read the situation wrong, the activist base of the progressive movement has concluded that if we are not moving the football to the left, it is getting moved to the right. And they are not very interested in playing that game, which may have dire consequences uh, coming. So in the midst of this situation, religious progressives have this additional challenge of crafting a response uh, con consistent with their uh, faith commitments. That's not to say that uh, we're out to uh, Christianize government necessarily, but we all have values, um, all of us, whether we are religious or not. And uh, most of us, I think, would like to live in a way that doesn't violate those values. More to the point, uh, religious progressives believe that their faith, or faiths, uh, gives them some insight into the common political situation, and they would like to bring those resources to bear in the uh, public square. In particular, religious folks think that their faith uh, tells them something about the systems that sustain our political life and what might be wrong with those systems. That is to say, we think that there is more to the current situation than just bad politics. There is something more to it that is holding us back. And bringing that more to light is, again, the work of transformative politics. By imagining what's holding us back and imagining creative ways around the blockage, we push toward a better deal in the future. Now, I happen to think that that sort of imaginative work is what the religious left, such as it is, does best. Where the religious right are the foot soldiers and cash machine of the conservative movement, I think religious lefties are meant to be the visionaries of the progressive movement. For example, 
and this is where we really uh, start to get into the subject matter of the book. The Old Testament scholar and uh, theologian Walter Brueggemann uh, speaks of scripts, these dynamic normative stories about how the world works and who we are in relation to it. These scripts claim to be able to keep us safe and happy. Brueggemann says that the dominant script in our lives is therapeutic, technological, consumerist militarism. Sounds like a, a mouthful. But basically, uh, uh, his point is that when we are presented with some problem in our lives, uh, we take a pill, we engineer a solution, we go shopping, or if all else fails, we bomb that puppy back to the stem age. And this is how we deal with our troubles. The promise is that you can be safe and you can be happy and you don't have to worry or think about the consequences. There will always be some medical treatment to take care of you, and there will always be some cheap goods for you to buy, and there will always be some military force out there to protect your way of life. And those are the promises. Needless to say, those promises are all bullshit. In fact, it is a subtle form of idolatry, according to Bruce. We learn to trust these scripts more than we do God because they promise us an easy way out of the predicaments of life. And God, by contrast, is selling the heart. So what I have done in changing the script is to take those scripts, uh, therapeutic, technological, consumerist, and militarist, and I, I use them as a framework for understanding why we are so stuck in our politics and how we might move the football a little to so, for example, uh, Brueggemann says that the therapeutic script promises that there is always a product or a treatment or a process to counteract every ache and pain uh, and discomfort and trouble so that life may be lived without inconvenience. I apply that to the issue of abortion, not to say that it is an elective procedure and uh, should therefore be discouraged, uh, nor to say that there should be no restrictions on abortion at all. Um, it is and should be regulated just like any other medical procedure. But to say that abortion is, of course, a medical proxy for other battles about the place of women in our society, that's not going to come as much of a surprise to the feminists out there. But the point is, until uh, progressives get out of the abortion is icky but frame, and start empowering, uh, focusing on empowering women, abortion is always going to be a problem for them. That seems like so much common sense, but when we hear about religion and politics from a liberal perspective, it seems like the line is exactly the opposite. The Democratic Party is heavily invested in the common ground on abortion, so-called, uh, which is essentially using the safe, legal, and rare line to attract ostensibly uh, swing Catholic and evangelical voters. It doesn't work. It's never worked. And I hope that my chapter on abortion provides the math to prove that point. 